Well, considering your father-in-law was a director at a major company, I'm just curious about how much inheritance he might have left behind. John tried to cover up his curiosity. I sighed internally, but kept a cheerful smile on my face. I heard it's $54,000. John looked shocked. My name is Catherine. John and I have been married for 20 years, and our son left for college this year. Life with just the two of us is quiet, but we get by. On weekends, John joins his colleagues for football and is out practicing all day. I work part-time, and on my days off, I indulge in gardening or attend yoga with my friends. Even though we do different things, I think we're a typical couple for our age. However, something terrible happened in our peaceful life as a couple. It started with a message I received from a friend who attends yoga with me. In the message, a photo was attached. I'm at the station now, but isn't this your husband, Catherine? I hesitated, but when I opened the photo, even from a distance, I could clearly tell it was John. He was walking hand in hand with another woman. My heart was beating loudly. Could John be cheating? He said he was going for football practice in preparation for tomorrow's match. But was that a lie? I think it's my husband. My friend responded immediately. What will you do? Do you want to come over? After hesitating for a moment, I began using my cell phone. No, I'm good. I'll talk to my husband. I closed the phone and sat down on the sofa. I had no motivation to do anything. And the only thought in my head was, what should I do? I could ask John, but I was afraid. What if he really was cheating? At this age, thinking of divorce, especially when I only have a part-time job to support myself, made me think that I couldn't possibly go through all that. If I pretend not to know, I can continue living a peaceful life like before, but the idea of pretending and the ambiguity bothered me deeply. I don't know how long I sat like that, but I was jolted back to reality by the sound of the front door. It was already seven in the evening. What's wrong? Why haven't you turned on the lights? John said, turning on the lights in the living room with a surprised voice. Oh, sorry, I fell asleep, I said. John laughed in disbelief and began washing his uniform in the washing machine. Seeing that, I realized he must have been exercising and wondered if the earlier photo might have been a mistake. If you're tired, do you want to eat out tonight? I asked eagerly, hoping that spending time together would help ease my uneasy feelings. Did you stop by anywhere else today besides football? Not really. Why? Just wondering. You mentioned wanting new shoes recently, so I thought you might have gone shopping for them. Oh, I haven't bought them yet. With that, our conversation ended, but the John in front of me seemed just like how he has been as usual. They say everyone has at least three doppelgangers in the world. Perhaps the man in the photo was one of them. However, once I began to suspect him, it was difficult not to. I often found myself doubting him during his late-night overtimes or sudden overnight business trips. Bad things do happen, and one day, on my way home from my part-time job, I stopped by the supermarket to buy ingredients for dinner. I realized my phone was ringing, so I took it out of my bag and stepped into a less crowded aisle. The name displayed on the screen made me frown. It was my brother's name. Though I occasionally communicated with my sister-in-law during events like our children's enrollment to their school or their graduation, I hadn't spoken to my brother in years. These sudden phone calls from your own relatives are often not good news. Hello, I answered the call hesitantly. What I heard from my brother was that our father's health was getting worse. He had suddenly collapsed at work and was taken to the hospital. After some detailed exams, they were told he didn't have much time left. My mother had passed away from an illness a few years ago, and although my brother and his wife had offered to live with our father after that, he refused and lived alone 
seemingly in good health. The last time I spoke to him, he sounded fine, so this news was really surprising. After telling my brother I would visit soon and hanging up the phone, I took a deep breath to calm my heart. When I told John, who came home from work that night, he looked really sad. I see your father. Don't worry about here. You should go see him, he encouraged. Motivated by his words, I went to see my father the next day. Dad, what happened? Are you okay? Oh, Catherine, I suddenly felt dizzy and couldn't get up. It can't be old age, I guess. Sorry for making you worry. His voice, usually loud and boisterous, sounded weak, causing pain in my heart. Though he looked pale, he didn't seem critically ill. Catherine, did something happen? Did you and John have a fight? I was taken aback by his sudden question. My father gave a wry smile. You're just like your mother, holding things in. Live as your heart desires, not knowing what the future holds. For a parent, seeing their child's smiling face is the greatest happiness. Realizing what he said, I was taken aback. Although I wanted to talk to my father a little longer, he told me he was tired, so I decided to leave for the day. Though my visit was only about 15 minutes, just thinking that he could be so exhausted from such a short time made tears roll down my cheeks. As I sat on the sofa near my father's room, waiting for my tears to stop, a man in a white coat sat next to me. Are you here to visit your father? I'm the doctor in charge. Oh, I'm so sorry. How embarrassing, I said, quickly taking out a handkerchief to wipe away my tears. Taking a closer look at the doctor, he seemed to be around my age with a kind face that made me feel at ease. It's all right. It must have been a shock for you. Do you have any questions? With his encouragement, I started to ask various questions about my father's condition and what to expect in the future. Despite repeating the same questions multiple times, he never looked annoyed and explained everything in detail until a nurse came saying, Sir, we need you. Thanks to him, even though I still felt sad, my heart was somewhat at ease. After returning home, recalling my conversation with my father, I decided to call a friend who had sent me a photo. I wanted to discuss the suspicions I had about my husband's affair. I've been worried I might have done something unnecessary by telling you that. I'm sorry for causing you pain. No, I'm glad you told me, my friend said. I finally come to terms with John's suspected affair, but I have no idea what to do. I confessed and my friend, chuckling, shared some advice. Actually, my husband is a lawyer. He said there are many clients consulting him about divorces due to affairs. I'll ask him for advice. Hearing this, I felt comforted knowing I wasn't the only one struggling. My friend immediately took action, telling me it's best to gather evidence of the affair and that I could use a private detective agency to do so. She even recommended a few agencies and offered to go with me if I felt anxious making me realize how invaluable true friends are. From then on, between visiting my father and working part-time, my days were quite busy. At the same time, my husband started saying he was getting busier with work. Overtime and business trips noticeably increased, and his suspicious behavior had me eagerly awaiting the investigation results. Two weeks later, I finally received the awaited results. At the detective agency, I was told in a hesitant manner that it was true he was having an affair. I was able to accept the reality without panicking or feeling too sad about it. In fact, knowing the truth brought a sense of relief, dispelling the previous uneasiness. They showed me some of the numerous photos and explained his activities over the past two weeks. There were also some audio recordings and it was worse than I had imagined. To begin with, his football games were only once a week, always in the morning for just two hours. The other employees always headed home right away after the game since they had families waiting at home. 
he spent all of his remaining time with his mistress. At times, she would even wait for him at a diner near the football court. He deliberately washed his jersey he falsely claimed he used at the game to ensure his lie wasn't caught. All his claims of overtime and business trips were lies made up just to spend time with her. The most shocking audio recording revealed him discussing with his mistress about getting a divorce from me once he inherited his money, predicting his father-in-law would pass away in a month or so. They had also discussed pre-booking an apartment near the train station. It seemed that his recent business was related to preparing for their new life together, making reservations for furniture and appliances. They even planned a premarital trip next month. All this left me feeling dizzy. The fact that my husband was eagerly waiting for my father to pass away destroyed any remaining love or affection I had for him. My only feeling was the increasing desire to divorce him. I paid a significant amount to the detective agency, took all the data, and decided to leave it to my friend to keep it safe. When I mentioned hiring a lawyer, they immediately agreed and offered to introduce me to someone they knew. However, I had used all my money on the detective agency and was hesitant to touch our shared finances. After some contemplation, I decided to swallow my pride and consult my brother about it. Why didn't you come to me sooner? He exclaimed, annoyed. Thankfully, he generously offered to cover the expected legal fees. I had a meeting with a lawyer and discussed my desire to work full-time or as a regular employee at my part-time job. I was told that they could hire me as a contract employee, which gave me hope regarding my financial situation. With everything now in place, I started thinking about how to broach the subject of divorce when, one midnight, I received a call from my brother. He was calling to tell me that our father had passed away. I woke up John and we rushed to the hospital. John briefly visited my father, greeted my brother and his wife, and said some comforting words to me. He then returned home by himself. Everything after that happened so quickly that I can hardly remember. There was the wake, the funeral, and meeting our relatives. I had no time to grieve. Even after the funeral, there was the matter of sorting out the house, discussing inheritance, and handling the legal aspects of my father's estate. My brother, his wife, and I were all exhausted. John, however, kept saying he was busy with work and didn't help at all. Despite my father having just passed away, John went out to play football on the weekend. My brother and his wife were visibly frustrated but refrained from saying anything because they knew about my intention to divorce him. With so much going on, I had to postpone the divorce. It wasn't until about six months later that things took a major turn. Finally, all procedures related to my father were completed, and the inheritance amount was confirmed. By the way, has your father's inheritance come through yet? It's scheduled to be transferred tomorrow. Why do you ask? Well, your father was a director of a major company. I was just curious about how much inheritance he'd leave behind. John tried to sound casual, but I sighed internally. However, I hid my true feelings and just smiled brightly. I heard it's about $54,000. That much? Yes, Dad must have worked hard to save that much. I just got a call today from the lawyer saying everything's ready. It'll be transferred tomorrow. So maybe we can go out and eat something delicious to celebrate. Emphasizing the fact that it would be transferred the next day, I smiled at him. Oh, right, John seemed lost in thought. The next day, after John had gone to work, before I headed to my own job, I conspicuously placed the bank book on the desk. When I returned from work, as expected, the bank book was gone, and instead, there was a signed divorce paper. I hadn't anticipated things to go this smoothly, so while thinking he took the bait, I headed to my lawyer handling my divorce and explained the current situation. I decided not to return home, instead heading straight to my family home where my father had passed away. 
Most of my belongings were already there. The things where I lived with John were shared, and how to handle them would be decided later on. Probably John and his mistress would end up living there. I've already submitted the divorce papers. There's no reason to contact my estranged husband. The only thing might be a claim for damages for his affair from my lawyer. However, since they couldn't contact him, nothing could be done at the moment. But three days after I returned to my family home, I received a call from John. Catherine, what's going on? There's no money in the bank account. Where's the inheritance, and where are you? Inheritance is mine. Why would you use it? I decided to play dumb for the time being by asking about my whereabouts. It seems John has returned to our home. I need to contact my lawyer immediately. Anyway, why isn't the $4,000 in your bank account? Did you take my bank account? I was planning to change the account for my salary deposit, but it disappeared. I've been looking for it. Don't mess with me. We're married. It's a shared asset. You should share it with me. I wish you wouldn't yell over the phone. It hurts my ears. The inheritance is an individual asset, not a shared asset. Plus, I've already filed for divorce. We're no longer a married couple. Please stop contacting me. I won't return home. It's okay for you to live there with your mistress. Goodbye. I could hear Joan catching his breath, but I hung up on him and immediately relayed John's whereabouts to the law firm. That night, I received several calls from John, but I ignored them all and enjoyed a drink by myself. Having endured the suspicions of John's affair for almost a year, I deeply appreciated the peacefulness I was experiencing. After a good night's sleep and checking my phone, I was shocked at the sheer volume of missed calls. I assumed my lawyer must have contacted him, causing him to panic. Hesitantly, I checked the messages. Some were aggressive, like, what do you mean by damages for the affair? If you knew, you should have said so. Others were apologetic. Catherine, I'm sorry. It was my fault. I want to talk things over. Without replying, I left my phone behind and headed to work. In my bag was a new phone, a number John wouldn't know. This would be my main phone from now on. I had John's personality figured out, so I was well prepared. Later, my lawyer informed me that John insisted on discussing this face-to-face, -face, so I decided it was time for a confrontation. I expected this and felt it was better to settle matters swiftly. I chose a family restaurant with semi-private booths for our discussion to avoid any public attention. As expected, John and his mistress arrived on time. Seeing John after months, he looked somewhat tired. Was it just my imagination? I had seen photos of his mistress, but was meeting her in person for the first time. She had her hair up in a bun and wore casual clothes. Her youthful face made me think she was a student, but I knew from my investigation that she was 25 and worked at a cake shop. I couldn't comprehend what such a cute girl saw in a 50-year-old man. Catherine, what's going on? There's no inheritance, and now a claim for damages. I'm completely lost. But both my lawyer and I couldn't help but chuckle at John's words. The inheritance is what my father left for me. John, you have no right to it. As for the damages, it's because our divorce is due to your affair, and you too owe compensation for the pain you caused me. It's not about the affair, it's due to our incompatible personalities. Besides, it wasn't you who brought up the divorce, I did. So the affair doesn't matter. Hearing such nonsense makes me want to pull my hair out. I knew he wasn't the brightest, but I didn't expect him to lack basic common sense to this extent. The one at fault can't initiate the divorce. It's not about who brings it up first. It's about you having an affair. If that's true, you understand that you're in the wrong, right? Also, I'll be demanding compensation from her too. What? Why me? 
Despite her cute appearance, she sounded very defiant and sharp. Is that true? John looked at the lawyer as if he was clinging on to hope. Unfortunately, it is true. You said I'd be getting money. I wasn't told I'd have to pay. I'm going home, and since I'm divorcing you, this has nothing to do with me. As she raised her voice, she grabbed her bag and stormed out of the restaurant. It was embarrassing as other customers turned to look at our table. We know where she works, so it'll be fine, the lawyer said with a reassuring smile, causing John's face to go pale. Perhaps he realized he couldn't escape. You know that girl is quite headstrong. She used to be a good girl when we were having an affair. She was always smiling around me and would cry, saying she'd miss me when it was time for me to leave. Even though he was talking about their affair, I didn't know how to react. After we started living together, her cooking wasn't great. She constantly wanted new bags or clothes. It was cute at first, but being married to her was not what I expected. Even though they'd only been married for about a month, complaints about her started pouring out of John's mouth. I've realized something. I've always been comparing her to you, Catherine. You're skilled at housework, great at cooking. You always waited for me to come home without a single complaint. So would you consider giving us another chance? I was left in disbelief and couldn't keep my mouth shut. I never anticipated this turn of events, and even the lawyer seemed too stunned to speak. There's no way. Come on, I'll change. I promise I'll never cheat again. You cheated on me while using the excuse of being busy at work, didn't you? How can I believe anything you say? John lowered his head, repeating, I want to start over. You said you were busy with work when my father was dying. He was in critical condition for about a month, but you never visited him even once. Even though I was having a difficult time, you were cheating. After he passed away, were you just waiting for the inheritance? I noticed our drawer being opened several times where we put our bank book in. You probably planned to leave once the inheritance came in, right, with the divorce papers already filled out. As I listed each fact, John began to tremble. He probably never thought he'd get caught. You had a reservation to buy a nice apartment already, right? But unfortunately, since you didn't get the inheritance, you had to cancel. I assume the old house we lived in must have been unbearable for her. How did you know? I asked. I have plenty of evidence, I replied. Are you thinking that if we get remarried, you won't have to pay the compensation? With that, John got silent. I must have gotten him, huh? Realizing he was only after my money made me really sad and disappointed. If there's nothing more to discuss, I'm leaving. Wait, John grabbed my arm as I tried to leave. Catherine, you're the most important thing to me. Please, I beg you, let's start over. John's eyes were filled with tears. I'll never betray you again, and I'll do all the chores. Please come back to me. Unable to contain his emotions, John began to sob uncontrollably. Come on, don't make a scene. Aren't you and your mistress, Nuliot? Why don't you two sort things out? Let's just move on with our separate lies. Turns out she's been cheating on me. She seems to have married me for my money. Without money, I'm just an old man. Seeing my ex-husband crumbling to the floor crying was undeniably pathetic but I felt no obligation to comfort him. People seemed to have heard our conversation, and it was painfully embarrassing to witness everyone whispering about John. Leaving my crying ex-husband behind, I picked up the bill, and my lawyer and I left. Later, as the two of them adamantly refused to pay compensation, I consulted with John's parents over the phone. Having little interaction with the rather shy in-laws who lived far away, this was my first call to them since thanking them for attending my father's funeral. To my surprise, I discovered John hadn't told his parents about our divorce or his remarriage to his mistress. 
This revelation left his parents in shock, with my ex-mother-in-law being bedridden from the strain. Give us some time. We're not sure what to do, was their unsure response, making it clear I couldn't rely on them. However, the next day, my father-in-law brought his brother to confront John. His brother, compared to John, was a lively, talkative, and cheerful man. John had often grumbled to me about how intimidating he was during family gatherings. Whatever transpired, his strong-willed brother made John agree to the compensation payment. Then his brother decided John would be taken back to the countryside. Tearfully, my father-in-law informed me of this decision. Since both in-laws were over 80 and had no income, they promised John would work at a factory owned by a relative nearby and pay me the compensation. As for John's mistress, her whereabouts were unknown. But since her workplace was known, they contacted her there. She shouted, don't contact my workplace. However, I spoke with a woman claiming to be the manager and was informed of an astonishing fact. It seems that the person John was referring to when he said, she's cheating on me, was the husband of the store manager, and she was apparently preparing to sue them. I was assured that John's mistress would never escape justice, and true to that word, a few months later, I received the compensation payment. When I visited the cake shop to express my gratitude, as expected, the mistress was nowhere in sight. Naturally, she was fired from the cake shop. She had dreams of becoming a pastry chef, but that's now believed to be impossible. Currently, to repay the compensation, she's juggling multiple jobs. According to the store manager, she can often be seen at a nearby construction site. Out of sheer curiosity, I took a glance and noticed her without makeup, sweaty, and being yelled at by an older man while she worked. Having to pay compensation for the two affairs she had, she must be deeply in debt. I'm not sure how many years it'll take her to repay it, but she got karma for destroying someone's family. When I told my son about the divorce, he was genuinely surprised, but he said something along the lines of, it's your life. You should live it as you see fit, which was a relief. My biggest concern had always been how my son would react. With me approaching 50, I thought there'd be no chance for love or even remarriage. But lately, there's someone I've been interested in. He's the doctor who took care of my father in his final moments. Every time I visited the hospital, we'd end up chatting, and I found him to be very nice and wonderful. After the divorce, during one of my solo trips to the shopping mall, we bumped into each other. In our conversation, I discovered that he was also divorced. We connected even more over our similar experiences. We've been out for meals a couple of times, and I always feel very comfortable around him. I don't know what the future holds, but I still hope and strive for happiness in my life.